Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas, Collins, LLC. All right, so thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk today about our two digital archives projects that Karen mentioned, um, the Louisiana Digital Media Archive and the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Then I'll also talk about kind of how the availability of these digital archives impact research. And then we should have plenty of time at the end to kind of answer any questions or just get into any discussions that you all want to get into. But first, I wanted to start by showing a promo that LPB put together when we launched um, the Louisiana Digital Media Archive. At Louisiana State Archives and at LPB, we know what history is. This is a story, and human beings love stories. For 40 years, we've been recording and saving Louisiana stories, your stories. Now we're opening up our video vaults to bring you history as you've never experienced it before. The Louisiana Digital Media Archive houses more than 40,000 films and videos, many of them one of a kind and they're waiting to be discovered by you. Dig through rare footage and uncover a hidden world from another era. Immerse yourself in the triumphs and tragedies of our state's amazing past. You'll find wildcatters and warriors, scoundrels and scholars, the people who made our history, and the places across Louisiana where history was made. Stories that matter, we're saving them just for you. Visit us at ladigitalmedia.org. Um, so I'll start by just giving you a little bit of background information about LPB. Um, yeah, we are the statewide PBS affiliate here in Louisiana, with the exception of New Orleans, though we do co-own WLAE down in New Orleans. We are headquartered here in Baton Rouge, and we've been on the air since September of 1975. Um, we are not affiliated with any of the public radio stations here in the state, though we do have good working relationships with them, and they do um, actually broadcast the audio from one or two of our news and public affairs programs. And then, so we present national PBS programming, but we also produce our own local content, and that's the content that I'm in charge of preserving. So the Louisiana Digital Media Archive is a 10-year collab collaborative project between LPB and the Louisiana State Archives, and specifically the video collections that are held there at the State Archives. Um, we started developing the project in 2010 through an Institute of Museum and Library Services National Leadership Planning Grant. Um, but the inspiration for this project actually goes back to um, the four-year production process for a six-hour documentary series we did on the history of Louisiana, and that's from the time the state was discovered through 2000. So from 1999 to 2003, our producers were going around to the libraries and archives around the state trying to find footage to use in this documentary, and it was kind of difficult. Um, so they realized, you know, that we need to first start preserving these things, but also making them more accessible, and that LPB also needed to start with our own archives as well. Um, so by working together with the state archives, we are able to pull our resources together to meet the challenge of preserving all of this content. And we also have very complementary collections um, that highlight Louisiana's um, history and culture, including a heavy emphasis on the state's political history. Um, and our website, ladigitalmedia.org, actually launched on January 20th, 2015. Um, we currently have 6,500 videos available, totaling 625 hours of footage, and those are all freely um, available for streaming to anyone with an internet connection. Um, and we are the first project in the nation to combine the collections of a state archives and a public broadcasting station. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about LPB's programming just to give you an idea of the types of videos that are available on our site. So the oldest video in our collection um, is actually the dedication of WLPB in 1975, and it includes um, Governor Edwin Edwards at the time ceremonially flipping the switch on the station. Um, it also had a preview of um, all the national PBS content that would now be available to Louisiana residents. So our flagship series is a weekly news magazine called um, Louisiana, the state we're in. Um, it started airing in November of 1976, and it still airs every Friday night at 7 p.m. We're currently in season 42. Um, and so you see our first host there, um, Beth Courtney, has been the president and CEO of LPB since 1985, um, but she did host the show for about its first eight seasons. And then there you can see our current host, Natasha Williams and Andre Morrow. So you can see the sets changed a little bit since the 70s. Um, but we cover um, 
the Louisiana legislature and state governments, and then we also cover other news of statewide interests and fun cultural stories around the state. And then since 1979, um, we started producing political debates, and we will be doing that again in September because we have a gubernatorial election here in Louisiana in October. Um, and we also do this for congressional races. Um, but our most famous debate was in 1991 um, between uh, Edwin Edwards and David Duke. And this election made national headlines because it featured Edwin Edwards, who was a former three-term governor who had been indicted during his previous term, going up against um, state representative David Duke, who had been a former leader of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and so <laughs> that um, election um, spawned a bumper sticker that said, vote for the crook, it's important. That's pretty famous. But we have um, the runoff debate from that election in our, that you can stream now. And then we also provide live coverage of gubernatorial inaugurations going back to 1980. And we'll be doing that again in January. And then um, we have also provided live coverage of the governor's annual opening address to the Louisiana legislature, which acts as our state of the state address. And this goes back um, to 1978. And so we are actually the only place that is preserving you know, these inaugurations, these debates, and these um, speeches, which is an important part of our state's political history. Um, so now I'd like to touch on just a few of our other series that are available. Um, so Folks was our minority affairs program um, in the 1980s. And so we would cover um, stories of interest to African Americans, to women, to Native Americans, to the disabled and other minority groups around the state. And this was really the only place where this was being done at the time. Um, another show that we have um, is En Francais, which aired from 1981 to 1993. And it was broadcast entirely in French. Um, as some of you know or may have learned while you're here, we do have um, Cajun and Creole populations who were native French speakers, and while that has declined, um, you know, there are still people who speak French here in Louisiana. And so this series was done kind of as a service to them. We actually received a grant um, last year to preserve the first six seasons of this program, so now the entire series is available to view. So there's 223 episodes. Um, and we actually believe this may be the only um, public broadcasting series ever broadcast in French around the country. Um, so next we have Louisiana Legends, which started in 1982, and we still produce a few episodes every year. So this is just a 30-minute interview show um, with famous Louisianians, and then it wouldn't be Louisiana without a cooking show. Um, so our longest-running cooking show um, is A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Folson Company. Um, so it started in 1990, and we still produce um, series every few years. And so it has Cajun and Creole recipes, and it also explores the cultural influences that have helped to shape um, Louisiana cuisine. And then we have broadcast documentaries on a variety of topics. Um, desegregation, A Dream Delayed, actually looks at the 50-year desegregation case here in East Baton Rouge Parish, which was the longest running in the nation. And then we also have kind of lighter fare, like um, documentary on Ernest Gaines, who's a Louisiana author. Um, and then um, photographer Herman Leonard, who took photographs um, of jazz musicians. Um, and then, of course, I think many of you visited the Old State Capitol, so we have one on the history of the Old State Capitol. And then through the years, we've also produced educational content for the classroom. Unfortunately, we don't do this as much anymore, but you know, these could still be used. A lot of this information um, is evergreen. And then I'll touch briefly on um, the collections over at the Louisiana State Archives. Um, so they have um, a number of collections that document the state's political history. And the oldest material in their um, collection goes back to the 1940s and early 1950s. So it's significantly older um, than LPB's collection. Um, they hold the collections for several commercial television um, stations around the state, including WWL in New Orleans, um, KLFY in Lafayette, and WBRZ here in Baton Rouge. Um, we also have the Brooks Reed collection. He was the ESSO reporter for WBRZ in the 50s and 60s, and ESSO is, of course, now Exxon. Um, and then they've also conducted video oral history interviews with a lot of people involved in state government. And they also have another series um, called Academy of Politics, which shows um, it was a series of lectures shot at the old state capitol about running political campaigns. And one of those actually features James Carville, who, of course, is from Louisiana. Um, so now I'm going to share a series of screenshots to kind of give you a, um, a tour of the website so you'll kind of know what you'll see when you go there. Um, so this is our homepage, and at the top you'll see there's a big search bar, and then we're also featuring um, 
our latest blog post. Um, so we highlight a different topic every month and we'll kind of do a blog post maybe highlighting 10 different videos that are the best for that topic. Um, and then we'll give you a link to more. And so this one um, is for Louisiana's military history, which was we did in November to tie into Veterans Day. And so if you were to click on that blog post, you would see kind of our best content on World War II and the Vietnam War, including um, collections of oral history interviews we did with veterans, of both of those wars. And so then um, if you were to continue down the home page, you can actually browse content in three different ways. The first is by topic. And so we have you know, very serious topics like civil rights, the environment, energy, to kind of very light topics like sports and Mardi Gras and um, Christmas, et cetera. You can also browse by series. So if you wanted to see everyone we've ever interviewed on Louisiana Legends, you could do that here. And then you can also browse by program. So these are generally like documentaries and one-offs that don't fit um, within a series. Um, and then at the bottom, we have our most popular series and then our newest edition. So you can see I've been busy cataloging folks lately. They're at the bottom. And so this is an example of what a set of search results looks like. Um, so this is for Governor Jimmy Davis, who is famous um, not just only for being a politician, but for being a musician who wrote You Are My Sunshine. But the thing I want to point out specifically um, about our search results is that because our collection is combined, you are actually seeing results from the state archives and LPB. You as an end user don't necessarily know that, but it does make our, um, the LDMA just a more robust resource for researchers. And then this is what an individual record looks like. Um, so this is from a Louisiana Legends interview with Chef Leah Chase, who unfortunately passed away earlier in the month at age 96. Um, so you'll see in the top in the right corner, it actually has LPB's logo, which shows this is an LPB program. Um, and then we have a lot of information kind of on the side describing this interview. So it was done in New Orleans. Um, I know it's hard for y'all to see, but you know, it was conducted in 2012. Um, then we have some keywords um, and a robust description. Um, so now that I've kind of given you the tour, I want to take it back to the five-year process it took for us to get to this point from 2012 to 2015. Um, so this is actually where we started when I <laughs> showed up. <laughs> and some of this may be familiar to some of you. <laughs> um, so I started at LPB in 2009 and it, um, you know, it's the first professionally trained archivist. So this is a lot of what I found. Um, so these are kind of the steps it took to get to having a website available. So we had no comprehensive database of any of our content. Um, we had a scheduling database called ProTrack, which we still use, um, that had information you know, about the shows we were airing and you know, had an ID for the, um, that would correspond to the tape library. Um, that only went back to 2000. And as I've mentioned, we've been on the air since 1975. So we had 25 years of just, we don't know. Um, and then every producer has their own filing system for their raw footage. Um, so that was just kind of scattered around and we really, we didn't know. So um, the first thing we had to do was develop our own database and we decided to build our own um, according to the PB Core metadata schema, which is used by public television and helps to describe audiovisual collections. And then it took us an entire year to inventory the entire collection. It was me and one other person. Um, so we actually found 18,000 tapes in that process. Um, so, I know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, um, so what we would do, you know, we would create a new record for um, every tape. Um, we would get any information we could off the tape spine. If we did have some information about it, one of the many databases we had going, um, we would put it in there and then, but we wouldn't play it. Um, so after that year and we knew what we had, um, we actually started digitizing our collection according to AV best practices. Um, and so we are still doing this and we'll be doing this for a long time. And we do that through a combination of grant projects. And we started an in-house digitization project back in 2014. Um, and so we have to prioritize what we digitize based on the age of the tape, the format, and then the value of the content, because we can't digitize everything, unfortunately. Um, and so digitizing, digitizing a tape is a real-time process. You have a 30-minute show, it takes 30 minutes. Um, and then for us, it takes an additional hour and a half to process those files because we keep three different versions once we digitize them. We have our preservation master. Um, we have another one um, that we can edit with in our editing system because we do use a lot more archival content in our new productions. Um, and then we create a web copy that we can stream on the LDMA. 
And then once I can actually view the digital file, I fully catalog it. And so um, the only descriptive information we have for a lot of our early content is from our monthly programming guides. And thankfully, we did have those since 1977. So somebody was saving those. And I'm so thankful they did, <laughs> because it's made my job at least a little bit easier. But I do literally watch the entire show and write um, all the show descriptions, all the information you saw on that Leah Chase record, that's what I do. So then if you're coming to our website, you can actually find it again. And then we had to um, create the website um, and then an API from our archive database to the website so that that information would show up. And then we've had to develop a digital preservation plan um, to help guide our long-term management of these digitized assets and then all the born digital material we're creating now with our new productions. And we know that we will continually have to migrate these as technologies change. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk about um, another project that we're involved in, which is the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. So LPB has been a participating station since 2009 um, with the pilot project, which that's actually why I was hired in the first place, was for three weeks to work on that project, and then I've been around ever since. Um, so this is a collaboration between the Library of Congress and WGBH, and they've been doing uh, running it together since 2013. And so WGBH is the public television station in Boston, and they produce a lot of the national PBS content that you're probably familiar with, um, including American Experience, Antiques Roadshow, uh, Frontline, and Nova, just to name a few. Um, so their mission is to coordinate a national effort um, to preserve um, at-risk public media content and to provide a central web portal to where you can search for um, public media content and to make the public aware of this. So you can actually access their online reading room at AmericanArchive.org and it actually also launched in 2015. Um, and then you can also view the entire collection on site at the Library of Congress um, in Washington DC and at WGBH in Boston. Um, so next I'm going to kind of show you a little bit about what's available on their website. Um, so this map of participating organizations shows the locations for the 120 stations um, around the country that are currently participating. So they cover um, 41 states, Washington, DC, and Guam. So you ever wanted to know what's aired on PBS Guam? Now is your chance. Um, so to date, the participants have contributed 100,000 public radio and public television programs, and 50,000 of those are available for streaming um, in the online reading room. And then if you were to click on each spot on the map, you'd actually be able to browse all of the records contributed by that individual um, public television or public radio station. And then you can also browse um, by a variety of topics, you know, from agriculture to women <laughs> and everything in between. And then um, they have also created um, a set of special collections that highlight either you know, an individual series um, that has been contributed by a station or even raw footage interviews from documentaries. So some examples, um, they have all the raw footage interviews from the Ken Burns Civil War series that you can view now um, from American Masters and also from Eyes on the Prize, which is the landmark civil rights movement um, documentary. And then some examples of um, shows, series that have been contributed by stations um, include Vision Maker Media, which is um, a set of about 40 documentaries created by Native Americans on Native American topics. Um, they also have Firing Line with William F. Buckley Jr. and Feminist Community Radio at KOPN in Columbia, Missouri. And then I'm also happy to say that our On Front Stay series is also featured um, as a special collection. So I wanted to highlight just a few of the news collections that I thought might be of interest to all of you, what they have available. Um, so one of the most exciting is the recently completed digitization project for the PBS NewsHour and its predecessor programs. So they are currently making every nightly newscast from 1975 to 2018 available in the online reading room. And so currently there are 13,600 episodes that you can view. And as you can see, they've covered a variety of topics um, through the years. And then in addition um, to national news reports, they also have local news reports from around the country. Um, and so by exploring these, you can see how national and international events help to shape local communities and also just the major topics of interest in you know, every state or community. And then another amazing collection that they have is actually the gavel to gavel coverage of the um, 
Senate Watergate hearings from 1973 and then the subsequent um, House impeachment he um, hearings for President Richard Nixon. So from May 17th to November 15th, 1973, every evening, public television stations would actually air the gavel to gavel coverage from that day so that people, I guess, who were working could actually view it. Um, they tried to do so in an unbiased manner as we do in public media. Um, and so you can actually go back if you were so inclined and view it the way that people in 1973 were viewing it. Um, but that is an awesome resource if you were researching Watergate. And then lastly, I wanted to show an example of what a record looks like on the American Online, or the American Archive Online Reading Room. So this was submitted by LPB, and so this is a show on the Atchafalaya Basin. Um, so what I wanted to point out first is that, you know, when we catalog something and make it available on the LDMA, we also send that information to the American Archive because um, we are committed, you know, to their mission of making everything um, about public television and public radio available in one place for researchers. Um, but because we do have our own archive, um, it actually, instead of sending the video, we actually link out to the LDMA. So eventually you'll have to come to us if you want to watch this. Um, but if a station doesn't have um, their own archive, um, you know, the video will just be there. Um, so now I want to talk kind of about the last portion of my presentation, which is how digital archives impact research. And so the first thing I think you've all probably encountered is that not everything is on the internet. Um, and so I just, you know, from an archivist perspective, wanted to talk about why that is. And I think, um, you'll probably be familiar with some of these reasons. So first, um, there are preservation challenges with every format. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about moving images because that's what I work with. Um, and the major issue we face is format obsolescence. And I think all of you understand that, you know, from a consumer level in my lifetime, we've moved from VHS tapes to DVDs to digital streaming. And it's the same, you know, in broadcasting, we've moved um, from three quarter inch matics to one inch reels to beta cams to HD cams to XD cams to digital um, formats and many others in between. And so many um, tape formats have outlived their shelf lives and the playback equipment required to play them is no longer available. Um, and then many tapes, as they start to deteriorate, especially three quarter inch schematic tapes, they'll get issues like sticky shed syndrome, which is when um, water gets in between the tape binder and it renders it unplayable. So that's particularly difficult in humid climates. And I think as you've all experienced being in South Louisiana in June, it's very humid here. So <laughs> that's something um, that we have to combat. Um, and so we are definitely in a race against time to save these tapes. I think a lot of my colleagues who are AV archivists think we may have 10 years left for three quarter inch schematic tapes. And so these are what were used in the 1970s and 1980s. So we're at risk of losing, you know, that portion of our kind of video legacy and history. Um, so next, digitization is expensive and time consuming. As I mentioned earlier, it has to be done in real time. Um, if you're doing it in-house, you have to get the playback equipment for every format you have in your collection. Um, you also have to have a dedicated staff person to actually make the transfers, to do the quality control checks, and to manage the entire process. And if you're sending it to a vendor, your costs go up because they're going to do all of that for you. And so just to give you an example, um, our recent digitization project for En Francais, we sent 169 three-quarter inch pneumatic tapes to a vendor. Um, and it was about 91 hours of content, and that cost $9,000. Um, you know, so we generally only send something to a vendor if we have grant funding. And then all the libraries and archives around the country are fighting for that grant funding. Um, and then, of course, it also requires staff time and resources to make things um, accessible and discoverable. So as I discussed earlier, you have to catalog it to be able to find it. You have to have a database to put that information in. Um, you also have to have the technical infrastructure to serve that up on the internet. And so because I work at a TV station, you know, we have a media server that can stream things just as a part of our normal operating procedure. A lot of the more traditional libraries and archives just don't have that. Um, and it's a lot more difficult to serve up video than it is, say, you know, a paper record or photographs. Um, and then uh, there are also a lot of storage costs involved. We save three sets of everything that we digitize. We keep one at the station, we send one to our transmitter um, in Alexandria in the central part of the station, and then we're trying to find a location to send something else further away, just in case something terrible happens and we have to you know, go back to that set of tapes. Um, and then there's also a lack of archivists at television and radio stations around the country. We think just within the public media system that we maybe have five to 10% of stations who actually have a professional archivist on staff who kind of handle this work. 
And then lastly um, is the issue of copyright, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, so LPB owns the copyright on the majority of our shows, which is why we can make them available online. But of course, there are always underlying rights within programs, especially with music programs. So you won't see a lot of music programs because musicians have rights to their performances, um, you know, and then there's the song rights, et cetera. Um, we have worked with independent producers in the past on co-productions, and so a lot of our contracts predate digital distribution, so we actually kind of have to make a judgment call sometimes of whether we feel comfortable making something available online or not. And then there are also programs we produced early on, especially in the 80s, where we just didn't get the copyright at all, and so there's really nothing we can do with those, because there's one in particular, if I posted it today, we'd probably get a cease and desist letter pretty soon. Um, and so for the collections at the Louisiana State Archives, they have been very lucky because the commercial TV stations and the donors have actually handed over copyright to them, which is why they're able to make videos available um, on the LDMA. And then for the American Archive, um, copyright's a particular issue because they don't own the copyright to anything that they're presenting. They're dealing with hundreds of copyright holders. Um, so that's why only half of their material is actually available for streaming right now. They actually work um, with the Harvard Law School and their law clinic to kind of make determinations about what they feel comfortable making onli uh, available online as well. Um, but we try to strike the balance between providing access and then the rights of the copyright holders. So in general, if there's kind of a judgment call, we'll kind of err on the side of making it available. And then if a copyright holder comes back and has an issue with that, we'll just take it down and try to you know, come to an agreement. But I also wanted to mention um, for libraries and archives you know, that work with other types of materials like manuscript collections, et cetera, you know, donors can place restrictions on those materials. So that's a lot of what reasons why you won't see those available. You know, it could be something they don't want made available until after their death or something like that. But if you're doing research at libraries and archives, just remember to reach out to us. It's our job to answer questions and we know our collections better than anyone else. So um, we should be able to help you. And so then um, the really awesome thing about digital archives is that you have um, greater access um, to archival collections you know, than ever before. And so um, before we launched the LDMA, if you wanted to um, see any of the videos available at the State Archives, you would have to visit the building in Baton Rouge. So if you live in Shreveport, Louisiana, which is about five hours away, that's a huge time commitment um, to do that. For LPB, you really were kind of out of luck. Um, we didn't have access to a lot of what we had, much less you know, being able to make it available. Um, but in 2009, we did start making kind of more recent content available online on our station website. Um, so with collaborative digital archives, um, you're able to bring together resources you know, from multiple archives in one place and just make a more robust resource. So like the LDMA, you can see everything on Louisiana um, history and culture in one place. And so the State Archives obviously has older collections that predate LPB, but we're still producing new content every week, probably three to four shows a week. Um, so we literally have content from the 1940s through 2019 available now. So that's you know, a pretty robust resource. And then on a bigger scale, um, the American Archive actually allows researchers um, to study you know, issues in a variety of fields at both the national and the local level. Um, and I think that's kind of the real power of this project. Um, so if you take a look at an issue like the Equal Rights Amendment, which actually came up um, in the Louisiana legislature this year, um, you can see you know, how it was reported on at the national level, and then look at how it was reported on at the states and kind of see maybe why it passed in one state and didn't in the other. Um, and so the American Archive actually also has a set of exhibits done by guest curators who kind of, you know, they'll do this. They'll look at how public broadcasting, you know, nationally and locally have covered a variety of issues um, from presidential elections to the civil rights movement. Um, climate change is another. And so then the last thing I'll say, um, I think the internet has made it easier to provide access to moving images in particular. Um, and there's something particularly powerful about moving images, which granted I'm a little biased because I work with them all the time, but they actually allow you, um, you know, to kind of really see and hear kind of what it was like at a particular time in the past. Um, and so one of the most rewarding parts of my job is actually when we have people contact us because they found interviews um, with family members that have since passed away. And so I just wanted to share one particularly powerful example. Um, so we had an interview um, with a man named Gary Weil who, 
um, was like the assistant secretary of the Louisiana Department of Commerce and from 1977. So it wasn't necessarily the most important interview that we had in our collection, but you know, we make everything available. And so um, fast forward, I'm cataloging Louisiana the State Run from 1982 and there's a story on drunk driving legislation and they actually had an interview with his mother and sister because it turned out he had actually been killed in a drunk driving accident in 1980. Um, they showed his picture and I recognized him immediately because I kind of remember things that I've seen. Um, and so it turned out his mother actually um, co-founded Mothers Against Drunk Driving here, the chapter here in Baton Rouge. Um, and so you know, that number one, I was able to make the connection between these two kind of seemingly unrelated um, stories, which is, you know, a good thing about having digital archives. But then, you know, fast forward a couple years later, we actually heard from their family and they told us that they had found these interviews and that for the younger family members, it was the first time they'd actually ever heard his voice, you know, because he unfortunately had been dead since 1980. Um, so, you know, these aren't the reasons we necessarily do this. Um, but it is you know, kind of satisfying. And, you, and my point too is that you basically never know kind of what you'll find once these things kind of go out in the world. Um, so that's kind of the end of my presentation. But before um, I take questions, I actually wanted to share um, a few uh, clips from our collection. Hopefully. Go back. Um, so I'll kind of go in chronological order. So this first report is probably one of the most important in the Brooks Reed collection at the State Archives. Um, it's a report on Hurricane Audrey. And this report was actually done 62 years ago today um, because the anniversary for Audrey was yesterday and that hit in 1957 um, in Southwest Louisiana. So this was kind of the first report um, from Cameron Parish in Southwest Louisiana, just showing the utter devastation. And this is kind of hard to see. Now we're in the town of Cameron, right in the heart of town. A stove and a refrigerator, a dead cat. Seems like these are commonplace in Cameron. Wreckage filling the streets completely. This is the main street in Cameron. You have to walk over, oh, it must be six feet, a six foot high pile of wreckage, wrecked timber, lumber. These are cars and other wreckage piled up outside the courthouse, the only building that seems to have withstood, to any extent, the ravages of the storm. Um, and unfortunately, um, that part of Louisiana was hit in Hurricane Rita um, in 2005, which hit about a month after Katrina and just devastated that part of the state. And then again in 2008 with Hurricane Ike. Um, so next, I wanna show a report from the WWL collection. So that's um, one of the stations down in New Orleans. And so it's actually from the Bogalusa Civil Rights March, which was in 1967, when um, a group of African-Americans marched from Bogalusa, which is kind of in the boot part of the state, um, from there to uh, Baton Rouge. And so you'll kind of get more information about it kind of in this clip. The Liberation March is now on its third day. 30 miles covered, 75 miles to go. Governor McKithen has called the demonstration ridiculous. Protest leader A.Z. Young says he may meet the governor in church tomorrow. I think the governor is completely out of reason. I think that he made a statement pertaining that he had to be in church on Sunday morning. We should be in church also. We've been going to church all of our lives. This is nothing new to us. Another thing, he made a statement about the march alongside the highway with horses. We realized that uh, if that weren't a racial problem, we wouldn't have to have protection on this highway. We could walk this highway without any police or uh, state troopers on, along the way. In lieu of these statements, and in respect to the forthcoming governor's race, have you made up your mind as of yet who you're going to support? No, we have not made up our mind who we're going to support, but I'm more than certain at this rate that uh, Governor Mike Houston is going, that Robert couldn't do any worse. A number of Ku Klux Klansmen, Confederate flags on their bumpers, their robes hung neatly on rear seat car racks, have passed the demonstration, going towards a rally in Crossroads, Mississippi tonight. But there have been no incidents. This is Ron Hutter reporting. And so it's certainly one thing to read about the Civil Rights March, which actually kind of be there on the scene, that adds kind of a whole nother level. 
And then I'll turn now to a couple of clips from LPB's collection. This next one is from Louisiana, the state we're in, and our legislative coverage. It's just one of my favorites, and I think you'll see why. It's from 1980, and this is State Representative V.J. Bella um, testifying very colorfully um, in favor of requiring uh, motorcycle helmets. Week in the House Transportation Committee, his bill author, V.J. Bella, made a colorful presentation of the issue. Jack, if I took this baseball bat and I hit the... That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. And if I took this other cabbage and I put it in here, and you see I tried to draw a picture for it, but if I put it in here, his head, I might have to buy this helmet, but I can tell you one thing. If I get that thing, that helmet is not broke, might knock the flange off, but that cabbage is not done. His head is still there. Because <laughs> <laughs> kind of went a little Gallagher on them there. Um, and then the last one, this is just an example of something I had, didn't even know we had in our collection. It was just honestly one of the coolest things I found. Um, so this is jazz great Dizzy Gillespie guest conducting the Southern University Jazz Band in 1985 as they were preparing for a performance of his music. For those of you who don't know, Southern University is the historically black college university here in Baton Rouge. He didn't play his trumpet much during the open workshop rehearsal, and when he did, well, it was barely loud enough to be heard. Yet just the sight of the legendary trumpeter with his instrument in place was quite enough for those of us on hand. Sponsored in part by the Louisiana Black Culture Commission, Dizzy and the Southern University Jazz Ensemble were practicing for a concert later that night. It was a very serious rehearsal, and Gillespie worked the band very hard to achieve the sound he wanted. That's a good way, I think, to end <laughs> on the presentation, so I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. <laughs>